So I'm just going to talk a little bit about some ways to keep kids healthy. Um, there's some different topics that I chose, so if you've got any other questions about anything that I don't um, speak about today, just let me know. And since we've got a small group, we can make it just more of a conversation instead of me speaking at you today. So if you've got questions about anything as we talk, just let me know. All right, so I just want to give you a little overview about some things that we offer here at the Bastyr Clinic. So we offer well child exams of all ages for all kids, um, condition specific visits. Um, so for things like eczema or asthma, kids with GI issues, type 1 diabetes, everything. Um, sports exams and sports evaluations for those kids who want to play a sport and need to have a physician sign off. We do that here as well. And then over here on this side, these are all of our specialty visits. Um, and I kind of chose some that might be useful for kids. So something like constitutional homeopathy can be really helpful for kids, especially those who have um, things like ADHD, sleeping problems, etc. Nutrition visits, you can have a nutrition visit for the whole family. So a lot of the times if you're choosing to change the way you eat or your lifestyle, sometimes it's best to have the whole family there instead of just one person. Physical medicine that talks about or we kind of do things um, treating the musculoskeletal system. So things like muscle aches and pains can be helpful, um, especially kids getting injuries and things like that. And acupuncture, some kids like acupuncture, you know, it's a little needle, some don't. I can see some shakes in the audience. So, so that's why it's, you know, you choose what works best for you. So a lot of these things I'm going to talk about are focused on the pediatric population, but a lot of these things are for adults as well. So for any age, and a lot of the things I'll talk about will be things that work well for kids. So I like to focus on the foundations of health. So all of these things are important. When any one of these things are out of balance, that's when we see issues happening. So if someone's not sleeping correctly or not getting the amount of hours that they need, um, then you can see an issue. Do you have a question? Okay, you're just raising your hand, yes and nodding. Okay, great. Um, exercise is really important. That plays a big role in someone's health. Um, getting plenty of sunshine. You know, sunshine provides vitamin D and it uplifts your mood. Um, getting plenty of water. Water is important for your kidneys and for keeping your muscles supple and helps to move around. Um, you know, if you're taking supplements or medications, you need to have water to move that around within the bloodstream and things like that. Eating the right foods for your body type and then having and dealing with emotions in a healthy way. So these are all important things. When one of these is out of balance, then we see issues. So I'm going to talk about these in a little bit more detail. So talking about the importance of sleep, I think this is probably one of the most important things, especially for kids, but I see a lot of adults who aren't able to sleep or they're waking up in the middle of the night and tossing and turning or not waking rested. So when someone's getting, you know, um, the correct amount of sleep, so I usually say about eight hours of sleep is a good average for most people. We'll talk about um, the amount of hours that a child needs um, in later slides. So if someone's getting the correct amount of sleep, you know, that means that they're able to learn and have a proper memory. So it's important for kids and then they're in school, need to be able to um, digest the information that they're getting from their teachers. Um, getting enough sleep helps to stabilize mood, um, so helps someone to be able to deal with stress and challenges, helps kids and other people cope with changes, and getting plenty of sleep will increase creativity or keep that normal as well. And that's something that we like to promote with kids, their creativity piece of it, especially nowadays where everything is done on screens and with iPads and iPhones. You know, how can we be creative um, without using technology is important. So when someone is getting less than the ideal amount of sleep, so say less than eight hours, you know, at risk for um, gaining weight and abnormal growth. So that has to do with the way that your hormones are stabilized within sleep. So if someone's not getting enough sleep, they're not able to process carbohydrates correctly. So that can lead to weight gain and changes in mood. Also, there's some research showing that not getting enough sleep can decrease your immune system because you're decreasing some of the important immune cells that your body needs to recharge at during sleep. 
also decreases productivity. So you can think of that as a kid having to do homework, staying um, with chores, and um, adults working in the workforce. So how can someone be more productive? Well, that's sleeping greater than eight hours per night. There's also some research showing that not getting enough sleep can lead to high blood pressure, and that can be in relation to increased stress hormones. So higher stress, not able to deal with stress, will lead to an increase in blood pressure, increase in weight gain, so it's kind of a whole circle of, um, of things going on here. So how much sleep does someone really need? So you can see here that newborns, um, they should get about 12 to 18 hours of sleep. And of course, that's not going to be a whole 12 or 18 hours throughout the night or throughout the day. It's going to be in chunks of time. So two hours here, four hours there, half an hour here. But in total, in a 24-hour period, they should be getting about 12 to 18 hours of sleep. Infants, um, about 14 to 15 hours. Toddlers, that one to three year range, about 12 to 14 hours. And you know, about by this time, uh, around three, three to five years, should be able to sleep throughout the night. So getting about 11 to 13 hours of sleep um, all in one span. And school age children should be getting about 10 to 11 hours of sleep per night. Teens getting average about eight and a half to nine and a quarter hours of sleep. It's difficult for teens to get this bunch of sleep just because they're on a different circadian rhythm than adults are and that infants are. So their, their minds and their bodies are set to go to bed later um, and wake up later. So they're kind of set to go to bed 11 p.m. 12 a.m., waking up around 9 or 10 a.m. It doesn't really work out with the school schedules that we've got going on, so a lot of the times I'll see teens who aren't able to sleep, and there's ways that we can kind of work around it to make sure that they're still having energy to make it through the school day. So that's kind of making sure that, you know, that their diet is really great and they're getting some exercise, maybe doing some supplementation if we're not able to change the amount of sleep that they're getting. But we can, you know, maximize the amount of sleep that they're getting by making sure they're getting quality sleep, making sure they're not waking up throughout the night. And adults, um, seven to nine hours, I like to say about eight hours, kind of staying right in the middle there. So you can take a look here and see, you know, is your child, are you getting enough sleep? Um, if not, then that might be a place to work on, a place to kind of strengthen their health. So I like this um, visual here um, about sleeping tips. And again, this isn't just for kids, um, but it's kind of kid-friendly here. It can be for adults as well. So a lot of good sleep starts with good sleep hygiene, so making sure a bedroom is dark and cool and quiet. Some people find that a noise machine or um, noise conditioner helps them to fall asleep and stay asleep. I like to say avoid the TV or radio and do something more like white noise machine um, works best. I'm um, trying to go to bed at the same time every night and getting up at the same time every day. No matter what your schedule is, it kind of gets your body kind of set and your hormones, your sleep hormones like melatonin and cortisol set to stay that way. So avoiding sodas and caffeine in the late afternoon and night. Caffeine usually stays in the system about six hours. So this includes um, sodas that contain caffeine and things like green tea and black tea. A lot of kids aren't drinking coffee, but perhaps teens are drinking coffee, and you can use that idea to apply to adults as well. Getting lots of exercise throughout the day will help um, somebody sleep, especially kids. You know, you'll notice if they're out running outside, doing a lot of swimming, that kind of thing, they'll sleep a little bit better that night. And so that all has to do with your sleep hormones. Avoiding big meals before bedtime. Um, you can try having um, just a light snack. Um, something like fruit can be helpful, but I really like to um, advocate for some protein before bed. So that can mean a, a handful of nuts or a slice of turkey before bed or a couple spoonfuls of yogurt. So not a full meal, but just a couple bites of protein because that will keep your blood sugar stable throughout the night so that um, so you're not waking up in the middle of the night when you, your body is hungry or needing some fuel. So that's an easy way to get someone to sleep throughout the night and starting pretty gentle. And then important, really important for kids, you know, and for adults too, is having a bedtime routine. Whether that's reading a book together before bed or taking a warm bath or doing some gentle yoga poses or stretches or things like that.
And definitely avoiding um, things like iPads, iPhones, TVs an hour, at least an hour before bed. Let's see, okay. So the whole idea with avoiding the TV and iPads and iPhones and that white or blue type of light is that um, your eyes take in the light and it tells your pineal gland, the gland to make melatonin. So when that light comes in, it tells that gland to say, you know, it's daytime out, it's light time out. We don't need to make melatonin to go to bed. Melatonin is kind of your sleepy time hormone. So it'll increase cortisol and decrease melatonin, which doesn't make for an easy, easy way to fall asleep. So that's why it's important to kind of avoid TV and those types of screens before bed. So some other sleeping tips, things that might be helpful for, especially for kids to help sleep is um, something like an herbal sleep formulas. You can find ones that are already pre-made. I'll talk a little bit about some important herbs to look for in a sleep formula that are good and gentle for kids of most ages. Um, something simple like lavender essential oil or a few, lav few lavender sprigs underneath the pillow can be um, nice and gentle and soothing for kids. You can take some of the lavender essential oil, put a few drops on the soles of their feet, um, and that can be an easy way for them to be calm, calm down before bedtime and help them sleep a little bit better. A neutral, neutral bath, so not warm, not cool in the middle, um, helps to create la relaxation within the body. You can get fancy and make a little tea, so an ounce of calendula, bulk herb, dried flower, and an ounce of lavender, dried flower. You can make a tea out of those. So maybe like a one to two cup tea using that much um, herb, and then you can add that to the bath as well. Works really great for um, infants and toddlers. And you can even keep the flowers in there and they can play with the flowers and things too. So kind of make it fun. Um, I'll use melatonin every once in, once in a while to kind of reset the body's hormones. I don't like to do it for more than two weeks, other the bo otherwise the body becomes um, dependent on that hormone instead of knowing how to make it and produce it itself. Is anyone here familiar with craniosacral therapy? Mm -hmm. So it's a gentle kind of light touch massage almost like therapy um, and it's working with making sure that the bones and the sacrum are all in alignment and it can be very relaxing and um, helpful for kids. It's a very gentle treatment. Good for adults too. You just have to drink a lot of water after. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any questions about sleep? Yes. Question? How many can I ask you? Um, let's do two to start. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. Um, so, circadian rhythm hormones um, and not processing like carbs correctly, stuff like that, mm -hmm. cortisol. Um, the blue light. You said it was called penal. Penal. Pineal. P i n a l. Um, so it is pineal. So it's your pineal gland um, that makes melatonin. Okay. And then I have a question about that. Is that in your like adrenal area, like down where your cortisol is, or is it in your brain gland? It's in your brain. So kind of um, near your pituitary. So it can cannot be affected by like cushions and things like that? Possibly. Mm-hmm. It kind of depends on what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then another question is, did they like you at children's hospital? Um, I was only there for a couple months. Oh, mm -hmm. No, you come back. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I had a good time there. I was mostly in the orthopedics department okay. with one of the well, I docs there. Like nutrition and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So yeah, I mean, they have a great nutrition center and mm -hmm. like that. But mm -hmm. yeah, they don't. They need you in the genetics part. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let me know. We'll talk after. Okay. Any other questions about sleep? Okay. Everyone's feeling good about sleep. Anyone have kids with sleep issues here? Yeah. Yeah, sleep's a big thing, and a big thing for adults, too. What, okay, so mm -hmm. really quick question. Uh -huh. My teenager wakes up in the middle of the night uh -huh. and can't sleep. Mm -hmm. So maybe that has to do with he needs to eat some protein before bed. Yeah, I would try a little protein snack before bed. And then, you know, with teens, it's a big thing about being on the computers, TVs, and all that. Even a half an hour before bed, if they can cut that out, you know, might see a difference. 
Okay. I would tell him. Uh huh. That. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and when, I have a really quick. Um, I don't know how um, first you are on sleep, but when? How much lack of sleep do you have to get before it starts to become mild psychosis? Mm -hmm. It really depends on the person, and so I like to think of the body as a cup. And so we've got, you know, all of these things going on, and let's say insomnia is kind of here, filling up, it's getting worse, it's getting worse, but they've also got stress, and they're also not eating well. Mm -hmm. So then your cup starts to overflow with things. Um, so you kind of, kind of got to figure out where can you whittle it down, and what do you have, what do you really have control over? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of things that can play into that. But sleep plays a big part into the majority of things. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, what? exactly is melatonin? I mean, like, where where do you find that substance if you needed to take it for two weeks or something like that? Because I always think mm -hmm. that, not that it was, like you said, not addictive but, or whatever, but mm -hmm. it can make your body not process it yourself. Yeah, well, it's a hormone. Right, it's a hormone. I'm not but sure it, where they... It can become too much, like they can kind of go psychosis from it or something? Mm, not, I mean, not, it's, not really. It can be, what is the word I'm looking for? Overdose or something. Some people can have funny dreams on melatonin. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't really heard of anyone having some okay. bad side effects from it. Not to say that it doesn't happen. You know, anything is possible. So, Oh, that's ultra mm -hmm. okay. And with teens and sleep too. So we you know how are we talking about how they are on a different sleep schedule? Well, it's actually true that on the weekends, if they do sleep in, they're able to catch up on sleep. So you hear that myth that oh, you know, I need to catch up on my sleep. Well, it's true mostly for teens is that they're able to sleep in on the weekends on that schedule that their body should feels like it should be on. That they're able to catch up on the benefits of sleep. So I talked about botanicals that can be helpful for sleep, and so I just wanted to highlight a few of my favorites that are um, gentle for most kids. Of course, checking in with your doctor before starting any of these just to make sure they're safe for your child. So things like um, catnip, um, which is also called nepeda, is really relaxing for kids. Of course, chamomile, you know, some chamomile tea before, before bed you've heard of that can also be helpful in tincture form. You know, any of these you can make in tea or tincture. Um, the California poppy might taste pretty bitter as a tea, but using the catnip and chamomile, passiflora, and the milky oats as a tea would probably be not too bad tasting. Um, but I like to use these as herbal tinctures and as a glycerite form. So the glycerite is a, a sweet form of the formula. And of course, kids like something that's sweet. It doesn't increase sugar or have any sugar in it. It's just the vegetable glycerin that tastes sweet. So you could look for a formula that has a combination of the alcohol extracted herbs and some of the glycerin extracted herbs. Chamomile is also good if someone's got some gas and bloating. And Passiflora is a typical herb for um, people with type A personality or have to, have to go by the stru a structure and they have difficulty relaxing. So it's kind of a classic one for that. Um, California poppy is sedative-like, so that should only be taken before bed. Um, during the day, um, they might feel sleepy. With these other ones, not really sedative, just more relaxing and calming. So it can also be good for someone who's got anxiety. Any questions about those herbs? The California poppy, mm -hmm. um, so is it sedative like, like um, looking at this? Uh, is it the same kind of... Um, sort of compound as the opium? Similar but different, mm -hmm. but same idea. Mm -hmm. So a teenager that took something like that shouldn't go have a UA done? It wouldn't come up in a UA, mm -hmm. yeah. So it wouldn't be com come up in a urine screen. Mm -hmm. um, this is also a nice herb to throw into a kid's bathtub. Mm -hmm. So you can mix it in with that lavender and the uh, camel, uh, calendula that I talked about before. Can, can you think of, I don't know if you've approached it yet, but mm -hmm. can you think of any kind of other than tinctures and oils and edible stuff? Mm -hmm. Like, I use ginger in the bathtub. I grate ginger mm -hmm. and put it in the bathtub for like a room that would be. Yeah. When I do that, it's like very cardiovascular, but it mm -hmm. also just knocks you out, just mm -hmm. sleep, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. Is there any other thing other than the ginger? Like you said, put it in the bathtub. Yeah. So, so you could do the California poppy, um, flour, dried flour in the bathtub, lavender, dried flour in the bathtub will kind of have the same effect. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so kind of moving on to food. So we talked about sleep as one of the big important foundations of someone's health. And now moving on to food. So what should someone eat? So this is kind of what I like to focus on. So lots of veggies, always at the top of your list. Um, that's always a big thing for kids to, to try and to get used to. So a lot of the times it's having kids try veggies, you know, up to 15 times before they actually decide they like it and ch will choose it to eat it. I'll talk about some ways to kind of get kids to try more veggies and eat more veggies. Um, lean, protein, organic if possible. Um, complex carbohydrates, so that's things like um, quinoa and millet, amaranth, buckwheat, those types of carbohydrates, and avoiding white processed flours and things like that just because they'll have a lot of sugar within them. Healthy fats, so things like avocados and coconut oil, um, olive oil, all of those things are really good for kids, especially for their brain health and cognition. Um, I don't think I mentioned um, fish will be in your protein list, and that's also really great for brain development. Um, fruits are kind of more at the bottom of my list. You don't want to do a lot of fruits because it's still a lot of sugar as well. So I like to focus on veggies and then go to fruits as um, at the bottom here, and focusing on seasonal foods if possible. So foods to avoid, just a very general list here. So things that have food colorings or added sugars, Packaged or processed foods, so anything that makes a crinkling noise you should avoid, um, and ingredients that you cannot pronounce. So those are all just kind of basic things here. The rule for packaged, packaged and processed things, if it comes puffed or a chip-like, funky mm -hmm. shape, mm -hmm. you can't have it in the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so it's that crinkly type of stuff. Yeah. Anything that's wrapped in that, probably a good thing to avoid. So here's just a nice visual of that. So here's part of your plate that should be protein. And you can see here non-starchy vegetables. So that's kind of avoiding things like white potatoes. I'm fine with things like sweet potatoes just because they have a lot of um, vitamin A and a lot of more vitamins and minerals than um, just plain white potatoes do. And here's your low glycemic carbs. So that's what we talked about, um, quinoa, things like that, and healthy fats here and clean water over here and then it kind of talks about the different foods down here at the bottom of the chart. Can we see this on their like, website or something? Is there a way to find this? You know, I'm not sure. I think I got this it from a friend. Small. Yeah. Um, remind me at the end and I can take a look at it. It looks like you've got some websites listed, listed on the bottom left. Are those the ones that he's looking for? Um, it should be. Let me see my sheet here. Oh my god, that's even smaller. <laughs> yeah, I'll just double check that one for you and get back to you. PowerPoint with the video I think it, even in PowerPoint, it was a little fuzzy. Yeah. Okay, I'll see if I can I figure out where I go. That's true. Yeah. That's a good point. You can Google anything, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So how do you get a kid to eat more vegetables? So the thing is try and try again. Give them a little piece here, a little piece there so they can try it. It takes a while for their palates to get used to something and to really like something. So the more they try, the more likely they will like that vegetable in the end. And it's always up to them to decide, right? So I just kind of wrote down some ideas of things that I'll recommend for kids to increase their vegetables. So adding them chopped small, you know, if you want if you want to hide them, you can add them small to soup and stews, then they're not really tasting it and trying it, but it's a way you can add it in if they're really not getting enough vegetables. Um, I like to add zucchini, um, grated zucchini and grated carrots to muffins. You can't really taste the difference. The carrots will add a little bit of sweetness too. It's a good way to use up your zucchini if you've got a garden in the summer as well. Um, you can have your kids help out in your garden or give them a little pot that they can grow things. They're more likely to eat the vegetables that they grow themselves. Um, have them help out in the kitchen with you. You know, have um, one of your little ones um, who's able to use a knife safely to use a small paring knife to cut some green beans. Or have a younger one with a safe peeler peel um, some sweet potatoes just so that they can get involved and once they're involved they're more likely to do things. Um, Having home um, 
salad bars so they can pick and choose the vegetables that they want so that they can feel like they have some control over what they're eating and you're still getting them a vegetable. Um, putting out vegetables in fun trays. I found this cute little picture of a turkey vegetable. You know, so they're more likely to eat something that's that looks fun um, than something that's just on a plate that they didn't get to choose and pick themselves. And then trying different wa ways of cooking vegetables, so maybe roasting a vegetable is better, they like it better than a raw vegetable. So there's many, many different ways to do this. There's lots of information out there. I really like the 100 Days of Real Food blog. Have you guys heard of that one? So she's really good about um, about packing school lunches. I'll show you some of her stuff just because I think it's so cool the way that she goes about it. Um, and they've got some really great ideas on that blog about getting kids to pack their lunches, to um, eat more vegetables, try things. And their whole story is that their family went on a challenge of eating only real food, so no processed foods for 100 days. And it's a pretty popular blog. So we talked about the importance of eating vegetables and fruits and trying to eat organic um, just because it decreases the pesticide load that someone has. Um, and if that is, if you're not able to buy everything organic, um, I just wanted to show you the environmental working groups, um, Dirty Dozen and Clean 15. So these are the most highly sprayed crops. Um, so they're highly sprayed with pesticides and insecticides and herbicides. Um, so you want to avoid these. So you want to buy these organic. Question? Oh, okay. Well, then you're a head start. You're on a head start than us. Uh -huh. I know that they actually, I just found, I mean, we're kind of low income right now uh -huh. with stuff, but I just found a uh, organic food, um, uh, food bank oh. and stuff like that. Mm. I, That's cool. I don't know if you'd ever heard uh -uh. Of or have ever heard yeah. of one, but I thought it was like amazing. Yeah, yeah. I've heard of some food banks having organic here and there, but it's kind of hit and miss. No, but I, I didn't know there was one. They only pick up and get. Only in Seattle, right? Yeah. Uh huh. Very cool. It was really. It's cool. good to know. Um, and then these are the clean 15, so by that they mean that these are okay to eat non-organic. Because, because most of them will have a peel like the cantaloupe or the avocados or grapefruit and they're just not um, highly sprayed crops just because insects um, and other bugs aren't attracted to them for some reason. Does that make sense? Um, so these are the different lunch boxes, and again, this is the information from 100 Days of Real Food. So she kind of did, if you go on her website, her blog, she talks about the pros and cons of, of all of these. So part of getting a kid to um, eat more vegetables and become involved in the foods that they eat is having something fun for them to pack their own lunches in. Um, so there's things like these Ziploc containers that um, will self-seal these little individual spaces here. Um, this is Planet Box. I think it's stainless steel that they use and there's you know little different size things for different types of foods like maybe you put a little treat here and then veggies here so it's kind of like the plate method that you saw the picture of before. And there's another style here. I know we carry some in our dispensary and you can find some of these things at um, many different stores around here. Do you talk at all about ro rotating food menus to keep kids not mm -hmm. Yeah, this is just basic information about food. It really, sometimes it gets more detailed depending on what is going on with the kid um, and you know what condition that we're treating or working with. Um, but this is just really basic information. Some kids, if they've got food intolerances, they do really well with their rotation diet just to not have that food on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Um, this is just a picture of one of these school lunches in those Ziploc containers. I just think it looks really fun and I'd like someone to pack my lunch like that every day. Um, these are some lunch helpers that can make lunchtime more fun for kids. Um, these are some pretty cool um, ice pop makers. So you can make smoothies and then freeze them and put them in their lunch. It kind of doubles as an ice pack and then a smoothie that you can add some vegetables in too. So a little bit of spinach, they won't know. Um, these fun little muffin cups to divide things like nuts and then reusable um, sandwich bags here. And then if you're doing soup or stews, keeping it warm in a little stainless steel thermos container. 
I just made a few notes of some after school snacks here. Um, things like apples and almond butter, hummus and veggies, you know, pairing a protein with a vegetable or a protein with a fruit just to keep blood sugar stable. Um, a veggie muffin, green smoothie, you know, the list can go on and on. Some cookbooks that I like for kids are um, things like, it's called, one's called Nourishing Meals and uh, Whole Life Nutrition. And then another one of my favorites is Feeding the Whole Family. So in all three of those books, they'll go through a whole list of different snacks um, for kids and for adults as well. Yeah, let me write them down for you. Just because I like writing on the board too. So it's um, Nourishing Meals, a Whole Life, nutrition, and feeding the whole family. All right. And the author of this book, she actually teaches at Best Year in the nutrition department, but she makes a sports nutrition for kids as well. So if you've got a kid that plays a lot of sports and you want to make sure that they're getting the nutrition um, to make it possible for them to perform, that's another good way to make sure that they're getting the things that they need. Is that Caitlin? Um, it is Cynthia Lair. Thank you. All right. So any questions about food, what kind of foods to eat? Mm -hmm. I do have a question. Um, something that I heard, and maybe you can dispel it as a myth, or maybe it's true. OK. But um, I did just recently hear that um, uh, when children usually don't like a food, uh -huh. it's possible that they may be allergic. So is that a myth? Is, it, is there truth to that? Is, can you help me? Um, I think that there's probably some truth and some myth to that. So let me just talk a little bit about food allergy versus food intolerance. So food allergy is when um, somebody eats a food and they become anaphylactic. So lips will swell up, throat swells up, they have difficulty breathing, they break out in hives. So that's more of an allergy and a really acute reaction. Something like a food intolerance. So a lot of people can be intolerant to cow's dairy or gluten where they'll eat the food and perhaps 72 hours later they experience symptoms. It can be within that 72 hours that they might have some GI upset, might change their mood, they might have worsening eczema, they might have worse sleep, you know, it can be a whole slew of symptoms. So that's more food intolerance, so their body just doesn't really react well to that food. So you're Do you think those sensitivity as an intolerance run together, or sensitivity would be like a lower dose of intolerance? I kind of lump sensitivity and intolerance together. Okay. I know they're different things, but I just kind of talk about them in those two broad categories. Um, definitely it makes difference for kids who are have those differences. So I have an example. Uh -huh. So one of my sons, is um, he has seasonal allergies. Mm -hmm. He does not like bananas, uh -huh. cannot stand mm -hmm. bananas. Could there be a correlation? It could be. And so the top, the top intolerances slash allergies, so it could be either or, are things like corn, wheat, dairy, um, tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, so all of your nightshades, um, peanuts, and soy are going to be your biggest food. Most, those are mostly likely food intolerances. Things like peanuts and other things are going to be more like food allergies. So then could the banana be a secondary then? It could be. Um, yeah, and so when I was talking about you know kids trying lots of things to see if they like vegetables, that's usually with vegetables. And a lot of times someone's not going to have, for the most, most most of the time, they're not going to have a real issue with vegetables, generally speaking. Okay. Does that make sense? But things like banana can be related to avocado because they're in the same family. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh. Um, I, um, do you believe that a child that could have an allergy to something like fish as a child mm -hmm. and then go through their whole life experiencing like eczema and asthma and different other things from mm -hmm. fish, could end up growing out of that, but then 
become allergic to other things or intolerant to other things later, like maybe it was they didn't realize that they were having gluten as a child or mm -hmm. wheat or pasta or whatever, and then become allergic to mm -hmm. these other things like the tomatoes and the nightshade yeah. and the other stuff, you know. Yeah, it kind of goes back to that cup analogy mm -hmm. um, where it kind of depends on what's going on but definitely your immune system can kind of change and your immune system changes as you grow older as well it doesn't really fully mature until someone is 11 to 18 years old mm -hmm. so fully mature foods different like you were saying kind of like you want them to try different things mm -hmm. so they can experience texture and taste yeah. and stuff like that and she this lady back here mm -hmm. was saying that her son just doesn't like the taste and yeah. has something to do with the intolerance I was just wondering mm -hmm. if they you know they could like feel it or taste it? I mean, it's possible. I haven't really heard of that so much, kids tasting it differently, but it's definitely... Like, they're, you know, their taste, but like they say that, I, I don't know, it's this myth debunk thing mm -hmm. that she was just saying, but yeah. they say that your taste buds change every like, certain amount of time or something. They do, and that's why you're... That's kind of going back to the veggie thing, where you're kind of introducing things at different times, and mm -hmm. you know, the more they taste it, maybe the more likely they'll like it. Perhaps that's because of taste bud change. Okay. Mm -hmm. So did I answer your questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So off the topic of food and on to screen time, it's kind of a big popular topic now. Um, so some different statistics that I'd like to bring up. So we talked about melatonin. So screen time reacts um, decreasing melatonin production just because of that light. So it kind of um, interacts with your sleep in that way. So it makes you less likely to fall asleep easily, waking up throughout the night. Um, screen time is also linked to irregular sleep patterns. So again, the waking and not staying um, sound asleep throughout the night. Also related to attention, def, um, attention and hyperactivity disorders. Um, so there, I found this one statistic I think on um, one of the Medscape articles that I was reading that for every hour that a kid is on screen time, it equals about a nine percent increase in attention problems or the ability to develop those attention problems. So. Um, I, you know, it depends on what the average amount of time your child is on screen time collectively. And a lot of times nowadays, kids are on the computers a lot in school. Kids will have their own iPads in school and things to do that way. So it's important to make sure that they're not on a screen the times that they are outside of school. Um, Screen time also leads to an increase in dopamine, and this was related to playing video games. So dopamine is kind of your reward hormone. So the more dopamine that someone has, the more that they need to feel um, like they are getting a reward. And so reward is kind of related to addictions. Um, let me see if I can explain that in a, a simpler way. So. Um, the more that someone plays video games, the more dopamine that their body produces, meaning that they need more exciting video games. They need to play video games more. Um, so b because they need to get up to that level, high level of dopamine that their body is used to. So kind of similar to an addiction. So if we compare it to something like alcohol, when someone becomes addicted to alcohol, they need so much alcohol to become drunk or to feel that buzz. Well, it's the same thing with um, playing video games or watching TV. What's the difference then between like a runner's high for somebody who goes out and has the endorphins of the runner's high and, mm -hmm. goes and gets like one and keeps going further and further? Sounds similar to me. I mean, is that still mm -hmm. kind of like a dopamine thing? Um, I'm not. A I endorphin? I think it's a different endorphin. Mm -hmm. um, this this video games were specifically related to dopamine production in this one study. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if you think about TVs, if you're sitting in front of the TV, it's all these flashing lights, fast-moving pictures, um, screens coming and going, characters in and out, and that is also related to um, dopamine and how someone interacts with the world. You know, they're, since they're always getting some kind of stimulus when watching the TV, it's really difficult for them to sit and read a book quietly, just because it's so different from watching TV and having the screens change and flash all the time. Imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it kind of comes back to that creativity and being able to relax, and um, so it shows that it's important to have a good balance of activities. You know, it's important for kids to you know watch 
some TV and be involved with pop culture, um, and then on the other end, you know, they need that balance of um, being creative and playing outside and being in the woods and um, painting and interacting face to face with people. So increased screen time um, leads to increase in obesity, so that's um, sitting and watching something instead of outside playing. Um, so TV commercials, a lot of times they're promoting junk food and seeing things on TV, then the kid's going to want to go and buy that in the grocery store or go and find that. Um, and a lot of times, you know, mindless eating, whether you're an adult or a child, um, during TV, and you know, I'm guilty of that myself, sitting in front of the TV and eating something, you don't know when it's gone. Um, screen time, with some other studies, they show that it's linked to an increase in body mass index as well. Um, and then I was also reading, this was the same um, Medscape article that the um, website is down here at the bottom. And so I really like this quote. They talked about a shift towards new technological skills, so learning computers and emails and all of that. Um, and it's a shift from fundamental sh social skills. So less face-to-face -face time um, with people. And you're more interacting with a screen. When I was searching for, um, I think it was on this slide here, I was, I actually was searching for a picture of um, family, or I said kids face to face. So I googled kids face to face. And what came up was a bunch of pictures of kids and families all with a screen or in front of a TV. So even on the internet I couldn't find people interacting face to face. They were all around a screen. That's kind of like how little kids, little babies, like if you show them pictures of babies and books, mm -hmm. they perk up because they're used to seeing their parents' mm -hmm. faces and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, and so this is where kids learn their social skills is face-to-face -face time. So learning how to read someone's facial expressions and the very minute changes in their body expressions and knowing when someone is feeling angry or feeling sad, there's all these subtle changes in someone's face. Um, and body language, and you don't get that from watching somebody on TV. And then also talking about mood changes and teens who are on Facebook and this thing called Facebook depression. I'm sure that's going to be a diagnosis soon um, where people are on Facebook looking at how you know, everyone posts things that they're excited about and good things in their life. And so other people are looking at that and seeing, and you know, grass is always greener on the other side is what it's like. So kids will, you know, wish that they're doing this or that and leading to, you know, a definite depression, negative self-esteem, negative body issues and things like that. So throughout all different age groups. Mm -hmm. You, go, you can go to school and church, and everybody's got their circles. So uh -huh. it's not just Facebook, it's, right. it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perpetuated throughout all, all pieces of life. So um, I was looking up some information on screen time guidelines, and so recommendation is for less than two years of age, no screen time. There were some differenting, um, differentiating opinions on this. So some resources that I found said no screen time and that there was no benefit from kids watching educational things, um, educational shows or playing educational games on the iPad um, or iPhone. So some people were saying no screen time and others said no passive screen time. So you can kind of see how that works for you. So passive screen time is just sitting and watching and not interacting with uh, technology. Um, so that's the difference there. Greater than two years um, recommended that um, about only half an hour per day. And you can see three to seven years, half an hour to an hour per day an hour per day for 7 to 12 years of age, and 12 to 15 years, an hour and a half per day, and then greater than 16 years, only about two hours per day. And this was from the National Institute of Health, their guidelines here. 
So what are some ways you can decrease screen time? Well, first, allowing no TV or computer in a child's bedroom, um, no TV during meals or homework, so using that time to work on focus and relaxation or interacting with the family members or friends, um, keeping a screen time record. If you Google screen time record, lots of um, templates will come up that you can use. You can um, have the child write in their name, and they can mark how much time they spend on a certain device throughout the day. You could try something like a one week no TV challenge um, and replace TVs and screens with things like cards and board games, radio programs, puzzles. There was a, a comic that I was reading in the paper and it was a, the real paper and not the paper online so I was proud of myself. Um, it was um, one of the family circus ones, and they were looking at cards, and the kid, w or it was one of the futuristic comics, and one of the kids had a deck of cards, and the kid asked the dad, where does he plug this game in? <laughs> okay, so any questions about screen time, those guidelines, how to make it possible for you and your family at all? Okay, so we're going to shift gears here and talk about um, some things that you can add to your traditional first aid kit. Um, so some things that I like to have parents have in their first aid kit for kids or just on hand if, they, if their child comes down with an acute illness are things like garlic mullein oil eardrops. Have you guys heard of these at all? So the garlic is antimicrobial and the mullein is soothing, so for an earache pain, just a couple of drops will do it. You just want to make sure that the eardrum isn't perforated, so it's a good thing to know or have, um, probably bring your child in to have their ears looked at. Um, something like Rescue Remedy, this is a flower essence, has anyone used it before? Yeah, it's a nice little um, dropper bottle and just a few drops with this one will also do it. So maybe five drops at a time if, um, if you get in a car accident and the child is anxious um, or, you know, like not a major car accident but just um, um, bumper to bumper accident or something like that. Um, or if the child's had a um, very stressful day and is feeling anxious or anxiety or a frightful event happened, this can help calm them down. What is the it's a blend of five different flower essences. So they're all kind of focused on um, panic and anxiety focused flowers. So it's more of the energetics of the herb, of the flowers that are used. Um, a calendula sa salve is good for bumps and bruises and scrapes, not really to be used on open wounds, but um, other skin rashes and things like that, a good one for camping. Aloe gel for um, sunburns. An herbal vapor rub for um, congestion and coughs. You can put it on the chest, you can put it on the bottoms of the feet, you can put a couple dabs underneath the nose to help open the airways. Um, a tummy glycerite, so we talked about the glycerite, it's the sweet preparation of the herbs. So something that contains maybe ginger, ginger fennel, chamomile in there. Um, um, this is fine um, for one and up. Mm -hmm. Um, Similison eye drops, these are homeopathic eye drops and are really great for um, pink eye or if someone gets to scratchy eyes, can be good for allergies too. Um, Arnica is another homeopathic. Um, this one's good for bumps and bruises, you know, when they um, get kind of pink and blue and purpley looking, that's the time to use this. Sprained ankles, it can be really helpful, so for swelling and bruises. Um, just a general pain reliever. Um, so you can, you can choose something natural. Um, they've got some pain reliever formulas or just something like a simple ibuprofen or Tylenol just for um, in the pinch of time. Um, of course, things like Band-Aids, gauze, scissors, and tape, and tongue depressor if you need to make a splint for a finger or something like that. So since we're getting into the summer months, um, the nice Seattle weather, we're going to talk a little bit about sun safety. So make sure you find a good sunscreen. I'll talk about in the next slide how to do that.
Um, regular skin checks, so just check your child's moles, if there's any funny looking ones, take a picture of it if you've got a smartphone or um, keep, it, keep it stored somewhere where you can um, refer back to that picture so that you can compare and see if it's grown or changed um, size and shape. Um, sometimes UV protective clothing or swimsuits can be really helpful for kids, wearing sunglasses and hats of course, and avoiding sun during the midday or sitting in the shade. Do you ever notice whether or not, I mean I don't even know why I thought of this, but that if a child has more allergies that, or eczema or mm -hmm. anything like that, would they do better in the sun? Like you know how they have those, those things that you go to and the doctor mm -hmm. looks at your skin and does like the therapy or something? Yeah. Like that? Or would they do worse? Some, some skin conditions are better in the sun, especially psoriasis, oh, um, sorry, can, yeah, can clear up I in mean, the like sun. If they just mm -hmm. had like milk allergies or something, mm -hmm. where they had an allergy to something and their skin kind of got rashes or something like that, mm -hmm. would, it, would it be more... I guess prone to getting a sunburn because it's like blemish or that's it, it might if you have some more sensitive type skin, um, it can be more prone to a sunburn. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, then, I do have a question about that. Mm -hmm. uh, we go on vacation to the water park. Uh -huh. We're going to be there in the cold. Right, yeah, you can't really avoid that. Yeah, uh -huh. so I'd be interested in a strong sun sunscreen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to talk about sunscreens. So something um, when you're in a situation like that, like the long sleeve UV protective clothing or wetsuit type things can be helpful. Not for your age of kids, it sounds like. Yeah. Uh -huh. So then just making sure they're reapplying the sunscreen on a regular basis, of course. So remember putting on the sunscreen about 30 minutes before going outside and reapplying every two hours, unless they're in the water or at a water park, you know, then every half hour or so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so how do you choose a sunscreen um, and how do you use one properly? So like I said, um, even just an SPF 30 is fine. Um, it's kind of a myth that the higher SPF, the more protection. And sometimes that can um, make things, make someone more prone to sunburn just because if you have an SPF 50 or 70, um, some people think they don't need to reapply it as often, but things like sweat and being outside and um, being around water, you know, can definitely get the, wash the sunscreen off. So it doesn't really make, um, Higher SPF doesn't really mean better protection. You're just making sure that you're reapplying it often. Um, some of the sprays, um, they can be useful for kids that are running around and making sure that they are staying covered, but a lot of them will have nanoparticles, and these are not to be inhaled. They can be kind of toxic to the system, so they're very, very tiny particles that the sunscreen is made up of, and they're not safe to be inhaled. So. You know, when you're spraying, a lot of people will just inhale it just on accident just because you're so close to the spray. And this information is from the Environmental Working Group, so if you have more questions about the sprays and how that works, um, you can get more information there. Um, avoiding oxybenzone containing sunscreen, that can be, that's a toxic um, ingredient in sunscreen. Um, the Environmental Working Group has a whole list of maybe 110 or so brands of sunscreens they give the thumbs up. Um, so I would recommend going to their website. You can just kind of Google 2014 EWG sunscreens um, and you'll get some information about the good ones there. Um, these are some of my favorites here. These are my favorite um, brands and they all get pretty good scores of um, protection and safety if you're thinking about chemicals within the sunscreen. Screens. And there's lots of different types. They come in sticks and um, kids specific types, um, more emollient types of sunscreens. So you just have to choose the one that works best for you. Other than the um, aloe vera gel, mm -hmm. what would you suggest for if they did get sunburn? Lavender oil, essential oil is also a nice one for burns. Mm -hmm. I would maybe put it in a little bit of carrier oil, so maybe mix it in with a little bit of coconut oil or a little bit of olive oil. Any questions about sun? So back to, uh -huh. yeah. So you were saying about the um, vitamin D, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, like, um, 
Is it, oh, okay. Is it better to take, like, if you have to take a supplement, like, say the child has a milk allergy or something, mm -hmm. or whatever, and they lactose intolerant, or yeah. whatever, and they have to take, they've been diagnosed as uh, low vitamin uh, D. Vitamin D. Mm -hmm. Is it better to take it in a liquid supplement, or is it better to take it in a pill? Or? Well, first of all, you usually will have the kid take it the best way that they can take it. Um, you know, the easiest way for them. If they're not going to do a liquid, then I'll give them a capsule. Um, but I really prefer vitamin D or any of the fat-soluble vitamins, so that's A, D, E, and K, to be in a fat-soluble form, so an emulsified form. So they sell liquid emulsified vitamin D. I just feel that people absorb them better, and I've seen better results with retesting vitamin D and those, those types of applications. Mm -hmm. So we'll kind of end by talking about um, preventing and treating colds and flus, and of course they're going to happen. Um, some, some ways that you can prevent them are by sticking and um, staying with the foundations of health that we talked about before. So eating a nourishing diet, getting enough sleep, enough water and exercise can go a long way in preventing colds and flus. Um, proper hygiene, so making sure kids are coughing in their elbow and washing their hands frequently during this time. Um, and then you all have the handout for the wet sock treatment. Has anyone done a wet sock treatment before? I think it's like in the warm feet of them, I think, so uh -huh. it work. Okay. But I've heard that it works, uh -huh. so I wanted to try it. Yeah. And you've done it too in the back? In a long time. Uh -huh. Yeah. Have you heard of a, like a raw potato? I was just about to ask this about the potato or the onion on your feet. Sort of uh, I've heard garlic too. So I think you can probably use any of those vegetables and... Mm -hmm. Um, so the wet sock treatment, you've got the handout here that we give to patients, but basically um, how you do it is you take a pair of cotton socks and you can um, wring them or get them saturated with cold water. Um, if you want to be really adventurous, you can toss them in the freezer for a little bit to get them really cold. And then you'll put them on your feet or on your child's feet, and kids do a lot better with this than adults do. It's hard to really tell an adult to put cold socks on their feet. Kids, it, it doesn't seem to bother them. It feels really good if they have a fever or a cold. So you'll put those cold cotton socks on their feet and then cover them with a nice warm, thick wool sock. Put them into bed, cover them with lots of blankets, and then in the morning you'll find that the socks are dry and that their congestion or their fever has gone down. It's even best if you take a nice warm bath or a warm shower um, before putting on those cold socks because that contrast with the hot and cold um, does a lot with the system. It doesn't have to do with like some people like their feet to breathe and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, with like if they've been wearing shoes all day. Yeah. Do your, I mean, even though it's a cotton sock, it doesn't like make them have stinky feet because teenagers are gross. No, it's just for one night, and sometimes um, you can. Sometimes it just lasts for a couple hours, and then they wake up, they're feeling better, and they take off the socks because they're dry. <laughs> I did this, I had a fever um, back in January and I did this um, during the day. I did my socks and went down and laid down and I woke up a couple hours later and my fever was gone and my socks were dry and I felt great. It was pretty cool. And it works a lot better with kids just because they're a little bit more resilient and their, their bodies work pretty quick. Um, and it just works as a reflexive action. For some reason, putting cold on the feet will kind of draw down congestion. Um, just because you're, you have cold here, so your body really needs to warm it up. So it bring thing, brings um, the circulation down to the feet. So you're increasing circulation, you're increasing the immune cells, and then you're decreasing congestion. And I really like um, parents to have an herbal, herbal formula that's safe for kids or safe for the whole family. Um, just a good um, antiviral tincture at home for the winter months. 
So that could be something like elderberry is a really great one. That one's good. For, it good that one is good for coughs and colds. You can do an elderberry syrup, so it tastes pretty good. It's safe and gentle um, for most ages. I would say above one, maybe below one. Um, below one year of age, you'd want to talk to your doctor before starting that. And probiotics. Elderberry and probiotics are really great immune support during those summer months. So if, uh, if, uh, if I have a kid who's really prone to getting colds and flus during the winter months, I'll have them start in September, mid-September with elderberry and probiotics as prevention. Could be good for adults too. Mm -hmm. I have a question about uh, elderberry though, and that's something that I've heard also. Uh, is elderberry, you can kind of build up a tolerance, so you're not supposed to take it for longer than like two weeks or something? Mm -hmm. You can take it longer than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll have people take it for six months, you know, the winter months. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, sometimes it works better in a formula with other botanicals, and then you're not just um, using elderberry as your crutch. You've got a lot of other immune support in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I like to have some elderberry during that time. Homeopathics, it's really nice for parents to have a homeopathic kit. Just a real basic, acute homeopathic 30C kit is nice, um, just because they work so well for kids and are really easy to use. Sometimes you only need a couple doses, and they're tiny little pellets and they taste sweet, so kids don't mind um, taking them. So good all around. Are these kind of things that are, are sublingual? Or mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And so best to do it sublingual. Sometimes kids will chew them, which is fine. Mm -hmm. However, they can get them in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you just want to avoid taking them with food because it decreases their efficacy just a little bit. So I just wrote, um, let's see, I've got seven of my favorite acute homeopathics here. And really, the information that I wrote about them is just very, very basic. So if this is something that you really want to get into using a little bit more, you might want to pick up um, a book that kind of talks about them a little bit more. But I just gave you some tidbits of these. So aconite, this one's really great for panic, anxiety, first signs of a, of a croupy type cough. Um, sometimes it's when the cough comes on from being in the wind a lot for some reason. Arnica we talked about, good for bruises, injuries that are sore to the touch, swelling. Arsenicum, this one's good for diarrhea, um, especially if the kid is restless. Um, belladonna, this is for sudden throbbing, headaches, really bad ear infections. Usually these are going to be worse on the right side. So a headache that's worse on the right side or an ear infection on the right side. Um, chamomile, so this is going to be the homeopathic preparation of chamomile. And this one's really great for teething, ear infections. This is for the child who's oversensitive to everything. Um, so everything bothers them. They want to be up, they want to be down, they want to be over here. They can't really decide what they want. They don't know what um, will comfort them. Um, good for upper respiratory infections. Pulsatilla is good for kind of the sensitive type child um, who gets an upper respiratory tract infection, ear infection. They're the ones that are really cuddly and need a lot of love and affection. So they'll be the ones sitting in mom or dad's lap and wanting to cuddle where the chamomile um, child will be crying in the mom's arms, crying in dad's arms, crying in grandma's arms. They are not happy anywhere. Um, sulfur, um, this is really great for acute headaches and ear infections, coughs, colds, and flus, so a nice basic one to have. And kind of the, this information here talks about the acute use, you know, so just for a few days at a time, but I really like to use constitutional homeopathy, so really getting an in-depth um, visit information about the who the kid is, how they interact with the world in order to prescribe a remedy that kind of really fits them as a person can be re really useful for a lot of things, especially chronic conditions. And I've seen a lot of great changes with kids who've got a homeopathic remedy as part of their treatment. And these are good. Um, they can be used just as acute, um, but we take some of this information in account for uh, constitutional prescription. 
All right, so I believe this is the last slide here. So these are my top four pediatric supplements. Um, so I, I like kids to be on a probiotic because it's really great for immune support, like we talked about preventing colds and flus and just having a good balanced immune system, really great for digestion and mood. Um, there's a lot of research coming out about kind of the, the gut flora that you have and how that relates to your mood and people who've got a different imbalance of different floras will have different changes in their moods. So that's really fascinating. Um, Omega-3, so things like fish oil, flax oil, um, flax seeds, chia seeds, really great for brain and skin health and immune support. Um, and vitamin D we talked about, good for musculoskeletal and immune support and also for mood. And sometimes it's nice to have a multivitamin just for some adjunct nutrition if you feel your child isn't getting the, the right amount of fruits and vegetables and vitamins and minerals that they need. So this is basic. I don't think that every, every child needs to be on all of these, but if I had to tell you my top four, these would be my top four.